Hey guys, happy holidays and just like you see, that's how my environment looks like in a holidays fashion. Uh, let's get in in a 2021st uh, year in a very uh, attractive, nice style, very popular. On the other hand, something that many of you asked me in the past to do it. Uh, today's uh, subject to the lesson will be Orus of Gambit. Somebody say Orus of Gambit accepted, we can call it this way, but it begins like a bishop opening or like a Pontiani Gambit. So how do we reach this Orus of Gambit? After e4, e5, bishop c4. This is nothing else but bishop's opening. I had like three videos about the bishops opening here on the channel and they got like a very big popularity. Thank you for that. And I have uh, another great news for you. Uh, I'm about to start making my next book. As you know, the first one was Butcher the Sicilian and it got a great success and popularity uh, thanks to you. Uh, on the other hand, next one will be about the bishops opening where I'm going to include both. I'm going to include popular uh, after knight f6, which is called Berlin defense against the bishop's opening. I'm going to include d3, uh, which is the main line. And nowadays, Nepomniachtchi, Carlsen, uh, Caruana, and all these guys use this. But apart from this, uh, I'm going to include in that book also d4, uh, which goes into the Uros of Gambit accepted. So. Uh, that's going to be the subject of the lesson today, and you just play d4. So, what do we expect here by black? First of all, you definitely threaten to take this pawn. Makes no sense for black to take this pawn on e4, uh, because simply it leads to uh, severe problems uh, for black after you play like uh, d takes e5. Uh, you can even consider playing the... Uh, queen h5 possibilities, but basically uh, after d takes e5, what is easily better? That's why they have to take on d4. Uh, simply they are forced since the pawn on e5 is hanging. And when they take on d4, you just go with knight on f3. I'd like to stop here and to tell you that this is like a very important crossroad about this uh, position. Uh, it, we still haven't reached like a classic Rus of Gambit, or some, some even call it Kedansky Gambit after they take on e4, uh, because uh, I, I call it an important crossroad, because, uh, for example, Carlsen used it back to 2019 against Wesley Saw. Some other top 26 and 2700 guys used it, but a very interesting uh, thing is that most of these black guys uh, didn't have enough... Um, I would say hard to go into the complications that arise after a subject of today's lesson that happens after knight e4. Uh, that actually means that if they go knight c6, we go into the Uros of Gambit declined or so-called, this is a transposition into the Scotch Gambit. Uh, knight c6 was the response of all the best guys who were... Uh, trying to treat this position correctly with the black pieces. And, uh, you know, we have like lots of possibilities here. And this is one of the rare videos that I haven't made so far in the chapter about the Italian opening and bishops opening. And basically, uh, I'm just going to do that in one of the next videos. So get ready for that one as well. Anyways, after 96, I'd like to remind you that I want to teach you to play castles. And if they go with 94, I'm going to show you in two videos to play both. To play Rook E1, uh, which is the main line of the Scotch Gambit, and another line, Nekmes and Gambit, that became uh, more and more popular lately. Uh, but more about these uh, continuations in some of the next videos. So after knight e4, uh, black just decided uh, to, I would say, catch the bite. And basically, uh, he just decided to take this pawn on e4. Queen takes on d4. 
we gotta stop here and uh, we gotta make uh, a bit of like a retrospective of this opening and to see what are like pros and cons of this position for both of the sides uh, I gotta tell you that this is like Russell Gambit accepted and Russell Gambit is a fun uh, of big line that can give many opponents lots of trouble. Uh, it might be wise for black to decline uh, this gambit if they're unprepared for it. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with going back into the scotch gambit as I previously showed you with the knight c6. And if black accepts the arrest of gambit, uh, in my opinion, white can easily generate a big attack and you guys just have to get ready for a slamming here. So after queen d4, they got to bring this knight back to f6. I say they have to, uh, which means that they, they are kind of forced to do that if they don't want to lose the game on the spot. Uh, there are like a very big probability that their opponent uh, can bring your, uh, this knight to d6 or can bring this knight back uh, to play queen on e7. Queen on e7 is a better version of this and if they go with the queen on e7 you just make castle. I'd like to uh, simply take a look a bit closer at this position and to tell you whenever you see that your opponent has king and the queen on the same rank and that on the, or on the same file and that file is actually open that's a great chance for you to finish them off almost on the spot. Here, knight e6 is probably the most logical and it's screaming to be done. Simply black develops peace, kicks our queen away, uh, in a way uh, stresses off uh, that pressure from the knight on e4. But when we bring the knight back to d1, we just want to play rook to e1 next, followed by knight c3 and winning the knight in the center. They got to move this knight, otherwise they're about to lose it. So they have to play knight c5. This knight simply wants to hide the queen and the king on the e file and wants to prevent all these threats by white uh, that arise after rook e1. After rook e1, knight e6, knight c3. Uh, white is much better. Why? First of all, uh, this king is on castle and in a way it's exposed and weak. Uh, second thing, I'd like to go with the knight d5 and pressure the weak pawn on c7. Third thing, uh, we just have like a huge development advantage. And the only thing that has to, I don't know, something has to be done in this position with it, it's the dark square bishop. So play it and put it on f4, or g5, play queen d2 and play rook a to d1. Um, I'd like to remind you, even though sometimes uh, you're about to end up being down uh, materially, uh, it's not the end of the world if your pieces are active and especially if your problems if your opponent has lots of problems with completing his development or just like in this case has weak queen weak development imprisoned bishops on f8 and c8 and especially uh, exposed king in the center so that's what makes this move queen on e7 being suspicious and what happens with knight d6 Knight d6 is a terrible line. Uh, in a way, it, it may look at first last uh, logical. I found more than uh, 30 games in the chess base played like this. And uh, after rook e, after castles, sorry, you just want to play rook to e1. Fun fact is that after knight d6, you're immediately winning. And fun fact is that after you make short castle, they can't stop a rook e1 check. So what does it mean? I'll show you uh, just two most common continuations in the practice. If they go with uh, like knight c4, which looks kind of logical because they just want to get rid uh, of this uh, pretty annoying light square bishop and on that a to a g a diagonal, and they just want to simplify the game by exchanging pieces, we got to make this intermediary rookie one move attacking the king. When they play bishop e7, you don't care about your knight, you take on g7. Rook is hanging, and when the rook comes on f8, you just play bishop h6. Take a look at this one. They can't stop queen takes f8. They're about to lose this rook, uh, to confront even mating threats. 
with the queen f8 in this position and i found more than 10 games like this uh, being played so far so it's a nice trick and i like it a lot then there is another uh, variation that goes with f6 like uh, no you won't be able to take on g7 even though your queen stands in the center relatively good but you won't be able to do that you still go with check they gotta go with bishop e7 take a look at this monster on c4 they can't make castle which is really a uh, funny thing but you play queen g4 and now they do not have too many options here uh, they can only go for one and you just threaten the pawn on g7 they can't make castle they can't do anything and in this game uh, black just tried to release the pressure by taking off the light square bishop on c4 after queen g7 rook f8 bishop h6 once again uh, we have absolutely the same principle rook on f8 is about to fall um, black went for 95 captured rook e5 and after queen f8 check king e8 rook takes e7 check uh, knight c3 and uh, black had to call it a day so I just showed you like two most uh, common continuations by black in practice that go with knight c4 and this one uh, engines keep showing some queen f6 but when you play rook e1 bishop e7 you have one very cool move here uh, I found uh, found out that this was tried in more than 10 15 games so far and none of these guys with white pieces made the refutation here it's this calm uh queen d1 move it's so special uh, because it threatens bishop g5 so you can't make castle it's so special because uh it gives you along with the bishop g5 knight c3 followed by knight d5 and at the same time you can even place this queen on e2 and harass this bishop on e7 or let's just say uh, tie up the king to be exposed and stay in the center in order to defend the bishop on e7 I like it a lot so after 96 castles they probably have to play 96 I say probably uh, but uh, the idea is just the same you play rookie one I don't want to insist on bishop e7 anymore because you just go with the same trick and if they go with the knight on e7 you just bring your bishop back here threaten knight g5 they can't play anything but a very poor uh, unsolid and uh, terribly wrong f6 and then you play knight c3 take a look at this position uh white has an upper hand here and uh, it's i believe that if you practically go into this position your opponent is about to resign his game very soon just because of this a worse of gambit accepted has to be played uh, by black guys with the knight on f6 when they play knight on f6 uh, this is an important moment for all of you to remember in many of the games from the past in many of the videos uh, online you're gonna find that white should be playing bishop g5 wrong pay attention on this accuracy you're you have to play first knight c3 and you're probably wondering what's so special uh, for black about bishop g5 and what's so wrong if we go with this move well if they go with bishop e7 then we go into the very pleasant uh, line that is going to be uh, mostly the subject of this lecture but if they play knight c6 instead of bishop e7 then we're in severe problems this knight on e7 does a great job it threatens the queen with tempo and many times this knight can even go for example if you go on h4 uh, can go there to defend knight e7 knight g6 and so after queen e3 which practically according to the to these top engines look like the only move you just go for queen e7 and when they play bishop f6 uh, queen takes e3 f takes e3 g takes f6 short castles I, I i would stop here i wouldn't go deeper than this and uh, let's just make a small analysis of this position we're down a pawn not that we're only down a pawn we also have terrible isolated pawn on a3 and uh, on the other hand yes they do have like two pawn islands like double pawns on f6 and f7 and uh, possibly weak pawn afterwards in the end game on h7 
but they have the bishop pair. They can play bishop c5 with tempo. They can play uh, d6, uh, bishop uh, d7 in long castle. They can even get the pawn back on f6 in order to, uh, let's just say, reposition properly their games, uh, th their, their pieces, and get into a good middle game with the bishop pair. All things considered, I wouldn't dare to go into this position. And that wouldn't definitely be my suggestion. There were like so many games played, but uh, generally speaking, uh, Black's experiences uh, were very, very fine here. Just because of this, my, my vote and my suggestion is go with the knight on c3. And here, we just have to talk about a couple of alternatives uh, for Black. They can go with knight c6, but apart from knight c6, which looks uh, probably most tempting here, they can also go with bishop e7, which transposes into the line with the knight c6, and they can go uh, into the like 50 50, uh, I would say, continuation in these positions. It's c6 followed by d5. When I said 50 50, uh, I checked stats, and according to stats, uh, all your opponents will play like 50% of the game c6 followed by d5 and another 50% of the guys will play knight c6 followed by bishop e7 or bishop e7 followed by knight c6. So it's time uh, to study these positions and what actually happens when they play c6. They just want to break, oppose in the center with d5 and fight against this bishop on c4. You have to play bishop g5, and they have to play d5. After that happens, you just have to make long castle to uh, prevent this d takes c4 because you're going to threaten checkmate. So let's first focus on this position uh, because this position uh, turned out to be one of the most common positions in practice. Uh, I'd like to tell you one thing uh, about these, uh, these position. Uh, for a small investment of one pawn, while it has quite a large lead in development, uh, computers are usually very optimistic about Black's chances here, but in practice, uh, White has scored well from this position. Uh, White wants to continue by castling queenside, just like you see, and bringing the age rook to the e-file uh, when Every one of White's pieces will be very active. On the other hand, Blake just tried with the c6 and d5 to kick this bishop away, to create a very, I would say, holdable uh, center there. And in a way, all he uh, actually dreams about is just to play bishop e7 followed by short castle. Uh, but easier said than done, because even in many of these games and lines, when black goes with bishop e7 and short castle, not that it's going to uh, be become and present like solution of their problems. Actually, it's going to uh, go and to lead even to bigger ones. So let me just show you in practice, how does it work? Um, after d5, uh, you just have to go with, uh, so d5, you just have to go uh, with rook h to e1. But of course, it's black's turn. So they definitely have to play bishop e7, and you definitely have to go rook h to e1. Why? Because you, they still cannot touch this bishop on c4 because there is a checkmate. Uh, you can always hope that your opponents will be bad enough, or let's just say stupid enough to blunder something like this. So you just go with this. After a long castles in d5, uh, rook h to e1, white doesn't have to save this bishop right away. So, just like we said, we insist on a good development. That's what I like about Russ of Gambit. And thank you so much for asking me to do it and sending me like so many messages. Maya, when are you going to do it? It's such an attractive Gambit. I once again have to get back to that moment where I thought that uh, Orissa of Gambit was originally Scotch Gambit, but it wasn't, so it was my fault. So after Rook H3 won, they have to go with uh, Bishop on E6. Simply, now they threaten to take on C4, and now uh, they just want to uh, 
uh, create uh, some uh, for the first time some defensive tactics and looks like they're about to make a short uh, castle without any problems once again d takes e4 leads to an immediate mate castle leads to positions where we play queen h4 and they still can touch this bishop because of an ideal development uh, in the center and great placement of these rooks on the open files so when they go with the bishop e6 you just go with the queen h4 queen h4 can be uh, actually uh, should be played here swinging the queen over to the king's side and allowing the rook to pin um, uh, this queen on d8 they can touch the bishop on c4 and this queen on d8 is still under severe pressure uh, this is a very important moment of the game because uh, they can play a very easily short castle uh, which is answered by most of the guys in this position and leads to disaster uh, they can play uh, they can move the queen for example in some of these lines uh, but it's not going to bring them any luck either uh, they can also play h6 which seemingly looks like solving a uh, solution of the problems uh, by this battery on h4 and uh, bishop g5 but that that also should not be a good 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 enough position um, let's take a look at short castle which looks so tempting and all the time i've been talking about like solution of your problems once they play like this so you bring your bishop back to d3 and for the first time you have like a very serious threat you have uh, mate in one uh you threaten to take on f6 and to mate them on h7 they gotta go with h6 uh, i found like zillions of games in this position and uh, even more wins by white in this game uh when they play h6 i believe uh, I don't have to ask you what would you do here by now being a subscriber of this channel at least you could have learned one thing how to attack and to mate your opponent so bishop takes h6 uh, they can accept or not accept this gambit if they uh, accept the gambit queen to h6 and now you have knight g5 now you have rook e5 rook g5 mating threats and a whole bunch of other uh different mating ideas typical ones this is completely winning also you even threaten to take on e6 at some point with some uh, easy and very smooth mating ideas um all things considered uh after an g5 they can't stop mate after rookie five they can't stop mate uh, or just be patient play knight g5 play uh rook to e3 rook to g3 or h3 play a uh, whole other uh like bunch of typical attacking ideas and mate them after bishop h6 they have to go knight e4 i immediately have to tell you that as soon as somebody reacts like this it means that you won your theoretical battle because you got a pawn back for what for the weak king uh great uh attack on the king side and they just have almost undefendable game i'm showing you a game where the guy played queen h5 once again they can take because this time this time knight is hanging and uh, it's even better uh so the thing is uh, they just go with g6 you play queen e5 threatening mate on g7 bishop f6 you bring it back here uh knight is hanging they take on c3 and you just play rook takes e6 what a beautiful move removing the defender and basically after f takes e6 weakening both e6 and g6 don't even care about the knight don't even care about the rook on uh, d1 that's not a point uh, we don't care about these pieces because they cannot do anything with them anyways we threaten mate in one queen g6 and don't forget at the moment we're down a rook that's uh, one of the beautiful things about this gambit they can play queen e8 simply you're about to play bishop g6 and you'll be completely winning with absolutely uh dismantled position for black on the king side so when they play like rook f7 to be able to play bishop g7 or rook g7 you give check and when they play bishop g7 you take when they go like this you take when they go like this you go here and when they go like this 
once again you don't seem to care uh, enough about this rook and taking the knight there so you threaten um, bishop t bishop e6 after knight e1 bishop e6 king f8 queen h8 you win it and this is a funny thing you're down a rook and the knight and you're still winning uh, the point is they can't play uh, king here uh, because you're just going to play knight g5 and they can't play king d6 because of fork and they lose the queen this is a special analysis if they go queen g4 uh, you have like a whole bunch of threats but g4 seems to be easily winning for you because if they take you just give check and win the queen if they go here you just go with this fork and win the game on the spot what a nice thing and finally after queen g7 king d6 queen e5 king c5 uh, white took on d1 i just showed you a game uh, between two guys and um, of course uh, it's hard to be said that anyone can play like this unless you learn your analysis this was correspondence game uh, with a fantastic precise analysis and what is completely winning here why because he's got a bishop and two pawns and way better development and they have a bad king for what uh for the rook but we just have like these three um connected pawns and we just have to start pushing them once we do we start to do that they're about to be uh completely lost apart from this after a castle's bishop decree they can go with g6 that should not be a problem for us because we can just play knight to d4 and after knight to d4 pressure this bishop on e6 in some of these lines go with the knight on f5 even or bishop f5 and go with the rook e7 uh, trying and attempting to take on e7 and f6 that's what i like rest of gambit accepted because it's full of nice attractive uh, tactical possibilities and apart from castle they can also go h6 reminds me on uh, scandinavian portuguese reversed colors where black goes with the bishop g4 queen h5 and whenever you play h3 it's like an empty move because they maybe played h6 in this position they're not even threatening to take on g5 as long as this rook is hanging on the other hand they can't make castle because i can't wait uh, to sack on h6 and it is especially going to be good once they bring my bishop back to d3 i didn't have to do it because they weren't threatening uh, to uh, take on um, a c4 but i anyways want to do it because this way i just prevent castles i just prevent castles simply saying because if castles you just sack on h6 so after knight bd7 you take on e6 that's a beautiful uh, trick bishop g6 check and you play queen to h3 you once again want to take here go after the king with the queen e6 and mate you, they once again cannot touch you because your this rook is hanging and after bishop d6 rook e1 uh we're down a piece actually we're not down a piece we're down an exchange uh they even have like a pawn um exchange and the pawn um they're up but it's not enough for them they play e5 bring the bishop back to e2 queen e7 knight h4 go on f5 you play knight f5 you play knight e2 you play knight e2 g3 take on d6 and play knight f5 with a great active pieces with a bishop pair uh, this king being misplaced on g8 uh, queen on h3 that constantly creates some um, very annoying threats in the light squares um white eventually managed to win this game i would say fairly uh, easily and uh, finally uh, we could have seen that after queen h4 they can do anything uh, but probably to play uh, black's most natural follow-up developing their last minor piece and uh, breaking the pin at last so basically now they threaten to take on c4 and they threaten to touch this bishop when you play like knight d4 uh, i'd like to stop here and to say according to uh, basis the main line and the most common approach by white in this position was bishop to d3 can you play that absolutely uh, they can't play castle easily you have knight d4 threat and you have like a whole bunch of other threats bishop d3 is absolutely fine but i actually enjoy 
that this move knight to d4, uh, where we sack a bishop and uh, threaten to face any short castle with a rook e6 followed by f takes e6 and knighting knight takes e6, winning back material. So what is black supposed to do in this game? Perhaps castling anyways is uh, probably the wisest thing here for them. But surely accepting white sacrifice is a critical try. Let's take a look what happens if they play like this. If they go with castle, don't hesitate to take on e6, play knight e6. You get the material back, you have a bishop pair, you just weaken the king. And what is sooner or later going to uh, probably crush uh, black and his defensive resources. If they go with the knight f8, trying to hold this bishop on e6 better, then you play f4, threatening f5, and having this king being remained into the center of the board uh, really, really creates uh, immeasurable consequences uh, to black. So they can play knight c5. Knight c5 is one of the most serious uh, defensive opportunities. You play bishop to d3 because they were just threatening to take it finally. And when you play bishop to d3, it's not a problem if they take it. You know how much I like to show you when we have this rook lifting. We're going to be able to put it here. If they make castle, I'm going to be able to put it here. Once I remove the bishop with knight a6, I'm going to be able to even um, generate like a better attack on the king's side with rook h3. And this just looks great for white. So all things considered, after h6, we just go with the bishop f5. Once again, we take advantage of not being able to take because of rook that is hanging on h8. And uh, the only move is knight f to d7. You should take and play queen g4. I'd like to stop here and to tell you that um, in practice, one thing is when you analyze with all these engines. And one thing is just when you, you know, like this engines always analyze cold-blooded and they will always say it's equal it's slightly better for black you don't have to pay attention to that because we do not play against the engines unless you play on some of these sites where they uh cheat like crazy so what do you do uh you just uh, have to be very happy because they have problems with exposed king and uh, queen being on the same file you're about to threaten before removing the defender of the e6 bishop you're about to uh, play some rook to e3 and rook to g3 or doubling these rooks or taking on e6. Uh, white has practically uh, better chances, uh, but it's not winning, definitely not winning. I would say just in practice, this should be way easier for playing for white than uh, for black. But just like I told you, this is one of the best options in the c6 lines for black. On knight e4, d takes c4. We just go with this knight takes e6. And just when they go like this, most of these guys will think, uh, will white go for queen c4? Will he go with rook e6? No, we won't go for any of these, but we're going to take on f6. What a beautiful move. You can't take by knight. You can't take by uh, pawn. You got to take by bishop. And when you take by bishop, we take on e6. And they can't play king f7 because simply we're just going with a queen c4 and this king is terrible. Uh, at the same time, d7 is hanging. They got to go with a king f8 and the specialty here, queen f4. White's down a full piece, but has all the play in the game. The black pieces are completely uncoordinated. Uh, and uh, white has the immediate threat of rick e, d6 or even better, knight e4, pressuring and uh, generating even a better attack on the king's side against the exposed king on f8. Uh, white is practically winning here. Uh, you have to admit that all these analysis against uh, c6 look really good. Another approach is if they play knight c6. Once they play knight c6, it's completely different uh, type of approach. Your queen uh, slides over the court rank right to the king's side and all of a sudden, with the bishop g5, long castle, and rook h3, one would like to uh, take a full advantage of the initiative. And somebody would say, don't take this position for granted. I would say, even if you do so, 
you're not gonna make a mistake because it can be played by itself just carry on develop your pieces in the most logical fashion and you won't have any problems after queen h4 they definitely have to play bishop e7 you play bishop g5 and here i'd like to discuss about the following options they can play d5 they can play short castle h6 and the most common in practice and the best d6 what happens if they go h6 nothing we're already used on this kind of things they're not threatening to take it and because this rook on h8 is hanging we go with the most logical thing any short castle you know how to react do i have to remind you take it queen h6 and go with the bishop d3 uh even knight g5 should be enough but bishop d3 leads to uh, an immediate win because they can't play bishop f5 any longer you'll play knight g5 and afterwards you'll do a bit of deflection with the knight d5 and mate is inevitable i found two games the guy played knight b4 knight g5 you threaten bishop h7 with mate uh knight d3 rook to d3 bishop f5 rook g3 and boom uh famous neistat played against uh some john doe guy uh, in soviet union back to 1950 very beautiful game and just like you see this is how he won with your of gambit 15 moves only uh in case of 95 you just take on e5 play rook h to e1 uh, you would like to, for example, bring this rook here. You would like to take on e5 and checkmate them. Queen d4. Uh, you're not even interested in winning the queen. Don't be greedy, please. You're you're going for mate. A beautiful move. Rook uh, to e4. Knight to e4. Bishop to e4. Queen is hanging, but more importantly, mate is undefendable. And this guy resigned. Another 16 moves game uh, between two Fide Masters. This game was played in uh, Krasnograd. Uh, I believe it's still Russia 2018. So just like you see, they can't play any h6. Any castle leads to, just like I previously told you, immeasurable consequences. So you go with castles, d6, bishop to d3. We're about to take on h f6 and mate them. They gotta go with h6. You don't look what you're doing. You just sacked and mate them. If they go g6, you have a very calm move to uh, break their defense you play rook h to e1 threatening to take on e7 and afterwards to win the knight on f6 they gotta go with bishop e6 and you can play like a whole bunch of moves but i especially like the engine suggestion g4 followed by bishop f5 white is practically completely winning and uh, finally if they go with d5 you just go castles bishop e6 you can take on d5 by knight by bishop but i like uh once again generating this pieces onto the open files and preparing for the mating attack i found one game where the guy played rook e6 or the guy took on h6 played queen g3 and he went for this perpetual check and made the draw but do you have to play like this definitely not can you take on d5 you definitely can do that uh, and don't even worry about this you're just better in most of these uh, these variations finally when you play bishop g5 and they just go with d6 you just go long castles and they go bishop e6 uh, bishop e6 makes perfect sense because they just want to uh, make their life easier in this position and it really makes sense it really looks cool and when they play bishop e6 you play rook h to e1 what happens if they play bishop f5 bishop f5 also makes a good practical point uh, and makes sense because they want to make castle we won't have any longer bishop d3 ideas and this bishop f5 uh, turns out to be a great defender of uh, potentially weak h7 square although now they have problems on the e file how do we take advantage of this we go with g4 they can't take by bishop because of bishop f6 queen g4 when they move it here queen g3 and now i want to play knight h4 followed by knight g6 removing bishop as a defender is uh, probably our priority we would remove the defender uh make the king side weaker uh, threaten afterwards h4 h5 win the bishop pair and uh, we should just push this pawns 
uh, on the king side um, without any hesitation. So in case they go with the bishop e6, you just play rook h to e1, you threaten this bishop on e6, they take on c4, you take by queen. They go castle, and this is probably one of the most critical moments for this line. It's very interesting. How should you continue from here? Uh, we absolutely have like the same amount of pieces. Where, uh, sorry, uh, same same amount of minor pieces. But speaking of material, we're down a pawn. That's very difficult because you need to come up with some initiative if you want to claim some compensation. And there we go. Bishop f6, knight e5. Knight e5 is good because practically they do not have an easy uh, developing moves. They can't play queen d7 because this knight, bishop, is hanging. We want to go with the king b1 placing the king, just like you know, whenever we play like long castle, we should place our king into safety. I also want to go with the knight e2, transferring my knight back to back to the center and e4 and harassing this bishop on f6. Um, engines usually show this for c8. I guarantee that it's very difficult to be played in a, a tournament game. Uh, they can't play rook e8. You just take and take on c7 and you're winning. They can't play queen d7 because you just take and they have terribly, uh, a terribly bad pawn structure around the king and we just weaken the king side. Uh, they can't uh, play knight e5 because c7 is hanging afterwards. So you can decide whether you want to take on e5 and take on c7 or do it immediately. So they practically have to play something. And rook c8 is one of the options. You put the king in a safety. They play knight e5. That's why they play rook c8. And now you have this move. And now you have a, a very nice way of slowly bringing your pieces into the attack and they still cannot play rook e8 which is the most logical because you play f4 take and after knight f6 win the queen with this fork maybe you haven't even noticed what are we threatening queen g4 threatens to take on c8 and afterwards knight e7 and to win an exchange this way that that's why uh, we have lots of lots of uh, great uh, tactical opportunities in this game and I believe that after queen g4 we're just uh, easily easily uh, better and they can hardly uh, stop this they probably have to play some c6 you play f4 they take on d5 you take on e5 and any transposition into some end game should be preferable for white finally they can go with g6 they finally found a way to solve the problem of their development and to place this bishop on g7. You shouldn't hesitate. Play c3 to soften the activity of the bishop on the diagonal. And when they play bishop g7, play h4. What's so special about h4? You want to go with h5. You want to break along the h file. You want to uh, afterwards... Uh, even uh, take advantage of the open h file for a possible attack in one of the game was queen d7 because it looks like the most logical thing to finally complete some of their development you play h5 uh, and after rook a c8 to be able to move the knight h takes h takes and queen h4 with the ideas of knight g5 uh rook here rook h1 if they move the knight 97 mates uh White was much better and eventually managed to win this game. Um, guys, thank you so much for asking me to make this Rus of Gambit video. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Especially, I'd like to thank to uh, Chris uh, who asked me to do this one. Uh, and um, I hope you're satisfied with your video. And more importantly, I'm, I, I, I don't want to say I hope. I'm pretty sure you're going to have like lots of great results with it in the future. And uh, let's go. Next time, I'm just going to show you some tricks in the Scotch Gambit accepted if they don't accept this or rest of Gambit. Thank you for watching and support us. Bye-bye.